Welcome to Rick and Bubba University, the podcast. Uh, we are excited uh, for the second installment. Uh, and uh, Bubba, today we're going to take on a topic that is at uh, the heart uh, of not just our country, but the world. And that is the fact that uh, climate change and man-made global warming, uh, catastrophic warnings, I mean, people crying in the streets, children refusing to go to school. Uh, this is a topic that is at the forefront, and what we're going to try to do today is to unpack that a little bit so we can at least have some facts to go along with maybe all this fear. And, Rick, what we're going to do, we're going to just peel back our political agendas. We're going to peel back our preconceived notions. We're going to even peel back our Christian Bible-based worldview a little bit, and we're going to look at hard facts, hard figures today with someone who is an expert in this field, Dr. Roy Spencer. Yeah, uh, Dr. Roy Spencer received his Ph.D. in meteorology at the University of Wisconsin-Madison in 81 before becoming a principal research scientist at the University of Alabama in Huntsville. That happened in 2001. He was a senior scientist for climate studies climate studies at NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center, and you love that, Bubba, where he and Dr. John Christie received NASA's Exceptional Scientific Achievement Medal for their global temperature monitoring work with satellites. Dr. Spencer's work with NASA continues at the US, uh, uh, for the U.S. science team. He's the team leader for the advanced microwave scanning radio, how do you say it, Bubba? Radiometer. Radiometer flying until he corrects us. Radiometer flying on NASA's Aqua satellite. Now, he's uh, provided congressional testimony several times, which a lot of you have heard, on this subject of global warming and climate change. And Dr. Spencer joins us now. Dr. Spencer, thank you for being with us. Ah, good to be with you guys. Thank you so much. Dr. Spencer, let's just cut to the chase of this. Is the temperatures on planet Earth warming? Well, very irregularly and very slowly, uh, yes. Since about the 1950s, we've seen uh, maybe a degree or more of, of warming. Um it's not as much warming as people are being led to believe, though, based on what we hear through the news. In fact, it's, the amount of warming is, uh, is probably too small for anybody to actually notice in their lifetimes. Yeah, we were discussing, and I know weather and climate are two different things, so explain that a little bit, too, because a lot of things we hear are more weather-based than they are climate-based. Well, sure. I mean, we're used to daily temperature ranges of, you know, 20 or 30 degrees, right? And then seasonal ranges, depending on where you are in the country, can be up to 100 degrees. So when climate people uh, start to freak out about temperatures rising at a rate of, let's say, two-tenths of a degree per decade, it's understandable that people really can't seem to get too excited about it because it's such a small change. Dr. Spencer, tell us a little bit about the method of doing this. Um, I mean, we've had weather measurements that we would consider accurate for, what, a little over 100 years. Um, how, do we, how do we measure these temperatures to say they're changing at all? And, and tell us a little bit about your, your satellite program there and how you guys are doing it. Well, this is one of the problems with global temperature monitoring is that all of our measurement systems were never intended for measuring such small uh, temperature changes, let's say two-tenths of a degree C per decade. Uh, you know, it, it, the thermometers at airports and our, our weather balloons and even our satellites were designed for measuring weather, you know, not climate change. So we're constantly struggling with this issue of of how much has it changed, how much has the temperature increased. Uh, and our contribution to this effort, myself and John Christie here at UAH, has been to use uh, satellites that have been flying since 1979. And they measure a deep layer of the atmosphere, a fairly deep layer, maybe 10 kilometers from the surface on up. Um, and we measure actually a fairly small warming trend since 1979, an average warming trend of only 0.13 degrees C per decade. So that's, you know, like 0.2 degrees Fahrenheit per decade, globally average. It varies somewhat depending where you are on the globe. Uh, so these are really small signals, and there's uncertainty about how accurate any of these systems are, because we're really trying to see a, a measure a needle in the haystack 
Well, I, and and Dr. Spencer too. I guess with what we hear on the news every day, mm. we we are led to believe that the Earth and the the environment, the climate, if you will, hangs in a balance. It, it's it's very unforgiving. It, it is a, a perfect. Uh, they almost give us a perfect model where you look at sunlight coming in and infrared energy escaping and. Is that a fair model, or is there is there more drift and uh, and 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 uh, cycles to the system that it's really not a perfect measurement that we can make even with the best equipment we have today? Well, uh, you raise a, a really interesting subject. Um, the temperature of anything. Let's let's start simple. The temperature of anything. Let's say a pot of water on the stove, or your car engine, or your body temperature, you know, of, of the human body. All of these things are a function of, of, of two processes, how much, how, how fast energy is coming in and how fast em- energy is leaving, okay? So for a pot of water on the stove, it's how fast the stove is pumping energy into the pot, right? Yes. But it's also a function of how fast the pot is losing energy to its surroundings, okay? And when those two things are in balance, the energy gain and the energy loss, when those two things are in balance, the temperature remains the same, okay? So, and that's true of anything. That's true of anything. Uh, so for the climate system, as you already mentioned, the, the temperature gain is from the sunlight, and the temperature loss is from infrared radiation. The Earth emits uh, heat radiation, infrared radiation to outer space, just like a fire emits radiant energy towards you. Uh, and when those two are in balance, then the temperature remains constant. Now, what's interesting is that the small rate of warming we've seen since the 1950s, okay, corresponds to an imbalance between those two energy flows in and out of the climate system, an imbalance of about one part in 300. It's a tiny, tiny imbalance. And What's an, another thing that's interesting about all this is we don't know the energy flows in and out of the climate system to better than about one part in 100. In other words, we don't know the natural balance of the climate system, that we could be having natural climate change and we wouldn't know it, okay, based on our measurements from satellites because we don't have the accuracy. So the warming we've seen since the 1950s, scientists just assume it's due to the increasing CO2 in the atmosphere from us burning fossil fuels. And that's a potential explanation. And I usually say, you know, from what I've seen, probably at least half of the warming that we've experienced is probably due to the fossil fuels. But notice these weasel words I'm using, you know, probably, maybe, right. it could be. Uh, and it's because there's a huge amount of uncertainty that we really don't know what is causing climate change, but uh, increasing CO2 is probably at the top of the list, but that's only because it's something we know. We don't understand natural climate change, but we know that we're producing CO2. So we're automatically biased in terms of explaining climate change. It's like, it's like the old story of somebody lost, lost their wallet on a dark street, okay? Uh, and there's an occasional street light here and there, and they're only looking underneath the street light. He, and you know, somebody asks him, well, why aren't you looking elsewhere? And he says, well, this is the only place where there's light, so I'm looking here. You know, well, it's the same way with global warming, is that the reason why we blame CO2 for increasing temperatures is it's the only thing we can think of, all right? We don't understand natural climate change, so we can't blame climate, uh, natural climate change even though it could be, you know, most of the warming we've seen. We just don't know. So that's part of the problem is attribution. You know, what's causing the warming? The other part that you're starting to talk about, which I think you're going to get into more, is why is everybody freaking out? And that's related to the fact that the people we hear from, whether it's the scientists that tend to talk to the media or whether it's the media exaggerating things or whether it's Hollywood and, and people like Bill Nye, uh, everyone exaggerates this. I mean, the, the only, 
in news, I mean, we've always heard in news, if it bleeds, it leads, right? Right. So what do you hear in the news? You only hear the most disastrous stories, the most disastrous predictions, because that's worth listening to. It's entertainment. It gets clicks, right? Right. Nobody wants to talk to me when I say, yeah, yeah, it's warming. Some of it could be uh, human caused, but it's no big deal. That's not news. You know, nobody wants to hear that. It's not entertaining. That's not going to get clicks. Well, it goes back to what we talked about, Dr. Spencer, with our own show. Uh, we understand marketing, and, and when Bubba and I were just getting started, uh, we said, well, let's act like we're a big deal because people won't know the difference. And if we act like we're a big deal, then people want to be part of something that we're portraying as a big deal. And and I, so I was going to ask you the question, since now you've opened that, and you're right, we were going to talk about that. Like, I'm holding a story today, and, and they use words like this, e- an expert – on the United Nations Climate Panel. Now, what does that even mean? Who is an expert on the United Nations Climate Panel? They don't give you their their resume. They don't give you their um, you know the, what what why we should listen to what they're saying. And then they go into this grim you know um, a report uh, that says you know that we're all going to die if we don't do something. And everything about you know rising oceans and and melting ice and and it's all tied back to to man made problems and and so why the hyperbole why why are scientists not coming together you know saying what you're saying we're studying this it's still in a theory uh, you know uh, stage. And and like you said, these weasel words, we we think this could be or or may or possibly this, but but we really don't know. And I think you brought up something uh, here on Rick and Bubba University. You're saying we don't know because we don't really understand natural climate change, right? And and the reasons why scientists, I think, buy into this. There's well, there's multiple reasons, and I've thought about this for decades. Uh, one of the reasons is. Um, First of all, we have to put food on the table, okay? All of climate research in the United States gets its money from the United States Congress. In order for Congress to give you money to study a problem, there has to be a problem, okay? Oh, yeah. And, and if there isn't a problem, then you're going to get money. And people like myself, you know, I, myself included, uh, our careers now totally depend on the fear of man-made climate change. So you got to keep that going in order to... Um, in order to keep the money flowing and have a career. So you've got to, you, I think people, scientists tend to um, reduce any misgivings they might have, okay? And they'll exaggerate the possibilities because a lot of this is theoretically possible. You know, it's possible that Al Gore is right and eventually temperatures will rise dramatically. You, you can't prove that it's not going to happen. Uh, but it's sort of in the realm of faith. Uh, so that's one of the things. Is scientists have to put food on the table. You know, you got to have a problem in order to get the money out of Congress. But also a lot of these scientists, I find, have a world view. It's almost a religious view that, that nature is fragile. And that sounds like an unscientific thing to have, an attitude to have for, for a scientist. But I find that all scientists have world views that, that they sort of fall back on when they're analyzing data. I've often said we could measure the data of the world. We could measure the three-dimensional state of of the Earth every day for years and years and years and know precisely what's going on, and there would still be different points of view, different opinions about what is causing temperatures to change because it's really hard to discern cause and effect in the climate system. Dr. Spencer, let me kind of go back to our, our first question in this about are we warming. In our lifetime, would it be fair to say that the climate on planet Earth has been stable as opposed to what we know scientifically has happened in the long past that we have not measured? In other words, we've had ice ages, we've had, you know, <clears throat> uh, it looks like catastrophic mm-hmm. events through either floods or asteroids or whatever it has, are we living in a fairly calm period for planet earth 
Uh, I think so. Yes. The, uh, there's proxy measurements of temperatures going back uh, one to 2000 years. And a lot of these proxy measurements of temperature suggest that it was just as warm as it is now about 1000 years ago during the medieval warm period. And about 2000 years ago, uh, during what was called the Roman warm period. Now I tend to believe that some of the warming we've seen is due to increasing CO2. Okay, Mm -hmm. but it's a small effect. It's been exaggerated by the media. It's probably more beneficial than it is harmful. We already know increasing CO2 has increased agricultural productivity in the world by at least a trillion dollars. Okay, because CO2 is plant food. We've seen greening of the earth from satellites that measure the greenness of the earth that have been flying since the early 1980s. Uh, so there's a lot of positive things going on, um, getting back to, you know, changes over time. There are studies of, of lake sediments along the Gulf Coast, uh, Florida, Louisiana, uh, Texas. And what they found is that a period about 1,000 years ago, I think it was, to 1,300 years ago, there were a lot more Category 5, 4 and 5 hurricanes that used to hit Uh, the Gulf Coast, and that the last several hundred years have been pretty quiet. So even when it comes to hurricanes, there are huge changes in hurricane activity that occur not just year to year and decade to decade, but century to century and probably millennium to millennium. We don't know why. You know, nature is a dangerous place. Um, and, And let me... Now that I've reminded myself, I should mention, for, his, for as dangerous as nature is, the deaths in the last hundred years worldwide due to weather events have gone down by over a factor of 10. So in the last hundred years, even though population has been, what, going up you know, right. dramatically, right? Population goes up, 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 up. The deaths due to, due to weather have been going drastically downward. And it's because, you know, our access to affordable and abundant energy, fossil fuels, has allowed us to build a standard of living to where we can protect ourselves from nature. So this whole idea that we're changing nature in such a way that's going to cause dramatic changes has things backwards, because there have been no observed long-term changes in severe weather, okay, in the long term. Maybe within your lifetime there has, but all of our long-term measurements uh, suggest no changes. About the only thing that should be changing and probably is, is with warming, you should get somewhat more heavy rain events. And that's about it. Dr. Spencer, and you brought up, I think, a key point. CO2, we're almost led to believe it's a poison. Oh, we got to be terrified of it. But it actually is, is absolutely essential for the planet And as you said, a little bit more don't necessarily hurt us, does it? Right. Yeah, yeah. uh, CO2 is necessary for life on Earth. There is very little of it in the atmosphere. Uh, The amount that was in the atmosphere before we started producing CO2 was historically pretty low. I mean, if you're going back, you know, hundreds of thousands of years, let's say, it was, it was pretty low, and uh, I've, I've had it described to me by plant physiologists. They said it's almost like before we came along and started putting CO2 into the atmosphere, it's almost like life on Earth has been sucking on atmospheric CO2 <laughs> so hard right. that it couldn't get any more out. It was like on the verge of starvation, and now as we add CO2 to the atmosphere, life on Earth is breathing more freely. Now, you never hear this. You never hear this in the media, right? It's, it's, you're not allowed to say stuff like this uh, because you're not allowed to portray anything that man does as being potentially helpful for the environment, even if it's inadvertently. And, and just by definition, if we're greening the planet, wouldn't that help to cool down the temperatures? Uh, probably to some extent. Yeah, that's, uh, that's, a, that's a more difficult subject that some people work on is, is the relationship between biological activity and temperatures. Um, what we do here is, uh, in addition to our global temperature monitoring with the satellites, is we're, we're funded by the Department of Energy to study these uh, climate models that produce so much global warming. 
and compare them to actual observations because these climate models that everyone is basing yeah. all of the fears on, okay, it, it's the fears aren't based on observations anymore. They're based on climate model projections. Right. And what we're doing is we're trying to validate or test these climate models against real world observations and try to figure out why the models are producing too much warming, because generally speaking, they are. They're producing about twice as much warming as we've seen in the last, say, 40 years. They're, they're not good models, basically, I guess, is what you're saying. Dr. Spencer, let me, let me move to part two that we talked about. Yeah. If, if it is happening, and you said that it is, but it's tiny, is it man-made? And what are our other options if it is not man-made? How can we explain this, or can it be? And I guess I, I want to ask, because Rick knows I love to harp on this, we have this thing called the sun, and it's a giant out-of-control nuclear explosion 93 million miles away. It gives all life on planet Earth a variance in that. How does that affect us? Earth's orbit, the tilt, magnetic fields. Can you, can you touch on all of that? What, is all of this a possibility in this? Well, there is a possibility that there are solar effects on climate, and I know that there's, uh, there's a lot of people, that, uh, including scientists, who are studying this. It's especially popular as a theory in, uh, in Europe. Uh, because that's where a lot of the original research is being done on this subject. Basically, the, the amount of energy that comes out of the sun, it's, it's monitored by satellites, and it it's, doesn't vary very much at all, not enough to cause climate change, at least not since the 1950s. It, it, but there are indirect effects related to sunspots and cosmic rays and cloud formation. That's this indirect solar effect that can potentially amplify things and some people think that, you know, that, that this might be part of the, of the natural warming that's going on. And I'm skeptical of everything because it's, everything is so uncertain. Uh, so that's a possibility. I, I generally don't ascribe to that. But what you find is that, uh, you know, if, if all you have is a hammer, then everything looks like a nail. Well, the, the people that work on this, uh, this, this uh, solar forcing of climate tend to be astrophysicists and, and people that, you know, study the sun, and so they figure, oh, well, the sun must be responsible, and it's, you know, it's like going to a doctor, right? You've, you've got some sort of ailment, and if it's a lung doctor, he says, well, I think it's in your lungs. If it's a heart doctor, he says, I think it's in your heart. If it's, a, you know, an oncologist, he thinks you might have cancer. So <laughs> what, everybody, te- everybody tends to see what they happen to be expert in. W- so, would, you, would you clump in the orbit of the Earth? I- is it perfect? Does it wobble? Uh, does it tend to elongate at different times? What, what, what are the facts on it? Yeah, the, um, the changes in the orbit of the Earth, uh, the, these are called the Milankovitch cycles, and they are what are usually used to uh, explain past ice ages, okay? Uh, but those are changes, the orbital changes, which have to do with uh, the, the tilt of the Earth and the, 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 the obliquity, obliquity of the orbit uh, of, the, of the Earth around the sun. Um, those are things that happen on tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands of years. They aren't, you, know, you can't invoke them to, to explain what's caused warming in the last, say, 50 years. Uh, because the orbit of, of the Earth around the sun doesn't change on the time scale of 50 years or 100 years or even 500 years. You know, those, those are very long-term changes. Um, so that's what I tell people whenever they ask me that question. So we keep hearing, I mean, like it's a fact, that if we don't make major adjustments, talking about mankind and industry and our carbon emissions and carbon footprints and all of this, of course, a 16-year-old just told us eight and a half years. Others have said 12. That if we, where are these numbers coming from? If we don't make drastic changes in this time frame, we're doomed. Oh well, for as long as I can remember, we've only had 10 years left. Right. Um, that's, that's for over the last back. 30 or 40 years. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for the last 30 or 40 years, we've only had 10 years left. Um, I guess it shows you care if you if you're constantly, you know predicting doom within 10 years. Even Paul Ehrlich, you know who he is, right? The, the population bomb. Oh, yeah. Uh, back in the 1960s predicted we only had, 
you know, about 10 or 15 years before most of humanity would die from a lack of food. And, you know, the, uh, humanity is better fed now than it's ever been. <laughs> it's just ridiculous. And rather than being taken to task, he, he continues to, to get accolades and awards. And it's, I guess it's because he cares, right? He cares enough to warn people. It doesn't matter that the forecasts are wrong. Uh, so all of these, you know, it's just more of the same, these, these predictions of gloom and doom, because the science doesn't support it, all right? The science of this gloom and doom, it, it doesn't exist. There is no long-term uh, increase in severe weather. There's, there's a long-term increase in weather damages, but that's because, you know, compared to 100 years ago, the, the, the coasts of the United States, for instance, are all built up now. You know, it was a little over 100 years ago when virtually no one lived in Florida, okay? It was just over 100 years ago that Miami became a town, all right? And now that whole metroplex is, I don't know, how many millions of people, right? And all that infrastructure. So, yeah, the, given the same amount of hurricane activity year after year or decade or after decade, the damage is going to keep going up, but it has nothing to do with weather getting worse. It has to do with more infrastructure that we've built being vulnerable to weather. Dr. Spencer, I want to ask you about a couple of other things we hear a lot of that could be a potential cause, and you, you, you can tell us your feedback on it. The magnetic field of the Earth and the poles flipping. Uh, I've heard a lot about that lately. Are the is the magnetic pole of the Earth about to flip, and, and would that affect this, and do we have a history of that? And I also want you to, to speak to, and we, we've gone from what I feel like science into the, you know, the Spookville now on the Internet. What about this Three Gorge Dam that the Chinese built that dammed up so much water that we hear NASA's claiming that it changed the rotation of the Earth? Is there anything to either one of those? Well... I, as far as the magnetic poles go, I don't think the weather really cares about the magnetic poles. Uh, as long as there's, uh, as long as the Earth has a magnetic field, I think it helps um, in terms of protecting life on Earth uh, from charged particles that come in from the sun. But other than that, uh, I don't think weather really cares. And then a lot of what you hear is just it's sort of fake science news. Um, just because we can measure something, you know, to the 10th digit doesn't mean it's significant. So everything, everything can affect global weather in a sense. You know, you, you've heard of chaos theory, right? right? You know, and the flap of a butterfly's wing in, in Tokyo can change the weather halfway around the world a month later. Well, it's true. It, it's just the way weather works. Um, but it, it doesn't mean anything. You know, everything affects everything else. There's no such thing as not having, there's no such thing as humans not having an impact on climate because there's no such thing as deer or squirrels not having an impact on climate eventually. <laughs> so what about the, the, the famous seas are now rising at one-seventh of an inch a year? Um, Due to ice caps and, 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 and the ice caps are melting. Uh, do we have ice caps still left, Doctor Spencer? Are they melting? And are they gone? I, I've heard some people say that you know the that that ice takes up more space than water anyway. That the level should be going down if they're melting. What what do you say to all that? Well, uh, it is true that in the warming we've seen in the last fifty years, let's say that the warming has been strongest at the high northern latitudes, and that's partly or mostly because that's the, where most of the land is, is, you know, if you go from south to north on the earth, you basically go from all oceans in the low, or I mean, I'm the mid latitudes of the southern hemisphere. And as you progress northward, northward, you get more and more land. Well, land heats up faster than the ocean. The ocean takes a long time to heat up. So whatever causes warming or cooling, the temperature changes over time are going to be greatest uh, the farther north you go. So as you get up towards the Arctic, that's where we've seen the most warming because that's where, generally speaking, most of the land is, even though I realize the Arctic Ocean by itself is an ocean, uh, but it's fairly isolated and it's not that big compared to the land surrounding it. Uh, so we have seen a decrease in Arctic sea ice, which is probably related to that warming. But what's interesting is that the sea ice 
uh, like our global temperatures that have me been measured by satellites since 1979. The sea ice also has only been measured since 1979. And there are proxies now for sea ice going back at least a thousand years that show uh, that sea ice in the Arctic has probably been declining for at least the last two or three hundred years. In other words, here we go again. Right. One of these nat natural climate cycles actually do exist. We don't know what causes them. Uh, sea ice has been declining for hundreds of years, and what we've seen in the last 40 years from satellites for sea ice uh, might just be an extension of a natural trend. We don't know. Um, so, yeah, uh, sea ice doesn't uh, sea ice doesn't change sea level if it melts, right? Because it's already floating. Uh, what's the, of concern is the ice sheets, which is uh, Greenland and Antarctica. You know, if those melt, then you're talking about a lot of sea level rise. But you're right, the sea level rise, I usually use the round number of one inch per decade. That's, that's what it's been. And it's been that since we started measuring sea level with tide gauges on a global basis. You know, there's scattered tide gauges around the world. Uh, we've been measuring that since the middle of the 1800s. That's all. But since the middle of the 1800s, sea level has been going up at about close to one inch per decade. All right. So something natural was going on uh, back in the 1800s that continues into the 1900s. That, so the question really is for sea level rise, has it been accelerating, you know, due to human activities, due to our putting more CO2 into the atmosphere? Uh, and it does look like there has been some acceleration, depends on what data you use. You know, they have to bring in the sat these satellites that actually measure sea level, which is a dicey thing. You know, trying to, you can imagine trying to measure changes of one inch from a satellite that's hundreds of miles up and flying around the Earth at tens of thousands of miles per hour. Um, the, the technology is pretty difficult. But assuming that, that what they're claiming is true, I've looked at it, and the acceleration that they're getting in the sea level rise is only about an inch every 30 years. In other words, the natural rate of sea level rise has been going up. Uh, and then in the last, say, 20 years, it's been accelerating a little more. But that acceleration amounts to only one inch every 30 years. So I say, you know, if you're worried about, you know, dangers of building along the ocean, and what the sea level is going to do in 50 years, I wouldn't build something that's only two feet from sea level. It's right. just not, you know, it's not smart for a lot of other reasons. There's storms, hurricanes, storm surges. There's an occasional tsunami that comes through that'll, you know, bring a wave in that's 10 or 15 feet tall. Uh, you know, nature is a dangerous place. So, you know, worrying about one inch every 10 years, yeah, don't, don't build that close to sea level. And then you've got these other issues that like, you know, the first part of Al Gore's latest movie, uh, he went to Miami, right? And they're walking around in flooded streets. Well, it turns out that Miami beach was built on reclaimed swampland. And there are uh, satellite measurements with these uh, specialized radars where they've been able to determine that Miami beach the land there is sinking as fast as sea level is rising, okay, so, which makes the problem twice as bad. And so, you know, you just shouldn't have built on such low elevation land when it's been, you know, it's, it's reclaimed swamp land. It's unstable. Uh, you've got natural sea level rise anyway. And then you've got the tides, right, the, the lunar tides. And, and these big flooding events in Miami Beach occur during what they call king tides, when, you know, the earth, sun, and moon all align and, and create an exceptionally high, naturally caused high tide. Uh, so all of those, those things combined together, um, yeah, they have to worry about it in places like that. But you have to take into account the fact that in some areas where sea level rise is a real concern, like Norfolk, uh, Virginia, it's because the land is sinking also. Well, and then, and Houston, oh my gosh, Houston, right. look at, look at maps that have been made of the land sinking in the Houston area. It's like five to 15 feet. Houston has turned into a bowl. Okay. So that when they get, you know, 10 inches of rain, there's no place for the water to go. It takes forever for it to drain off. 
because the, it's, it's turned in, Houston is a bowl now, and, and the water just doesn't want to go anywhere. Well, and, and I think, I know we're getting ready to close this out, so here, here's what we, we hear a theme throughout what you're saying. I feel like you're the guy that did the TV show where he shows you how the illusionists actually do the trick. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and that's what this feels like today. What you're saying, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, because I want, I want them to hear that from you, because I, I don't have the credentials that you have. What I'm hearing is we really are having a difficult time deciding what is natural and what is man-made, and you're already saying some of these things that cameras and uh, these people tell you are caused by man, you just explained. No, these things are actually they're, they're, they're being contributed to by natural occurrences like the land sinking, uh, the, the king tides. Some of this stuff that's being called man-made is actually naturally occurring. So I guess when we get down to it, when someone says, and this happens, Bubba, you, you support me all the time. It happened yesterday on the show because we were talking about how science, not just a biblical worldview, but science has shown us where life begins. And sure enough, we get a call. Well, guys, you said science shows you where life begins. Well, it also has shown you that there's man-made catastrophic climate change. And I said, no, science hasn't shown us that. It is still a theory. Is it, is it true or not? Is it a fact that there is, there is scientific proof that there is man-made catastrophic climate change and global warming? Well, no, not if you phrase it that way. Yeah. About the only thing that we know with reasonable certainty is that increasing CO2 should cause some warming. We don't know how much. That's where, that's sort of the holy grail of climate research is how much of the warming uh, or how much warming will occur, let's say, if we double the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere. That's what's called climate sensitivity. That's where I spend a lot of my research time. And it's, it's a huge uncertainty. So the people that, that think that there's catastrophic climate change thinks, think that climate sensitivity is really high. In other words, that the this, this system is very sensitive to adding CO2 and it produces a huge amount of warming. Um, our research that we've published over the last 10 years that tend to suggest just the opposite, that the climate system isn't very sensitive at all to how much CO2 that we put in the atmosphere, but nevertheless, it probably is causing some warming, okay? Uh, so then it comes down to, well, is it enough to worry about? Uh, and if you're one of those that thinks, well, we shouldn't be meddling in the climate system at all, uh, you have to ask the que- answer the question, what can you do to change it? I mean, we already know that if the United States were to just disappear and the rest of the world went on about its business, the effect on global temperatures by the end of the century would be unmeasurable. And that's assuming the UN's numbers for climate sensitivity. OK, um, so the things that people are, pro- are, are proposing are just they will have no measurable impact. Uh, and, and unfortunately, you know, there's just a lot of exaggeration and assumptions going on that can't be supported. You know, Greta Thunberg told the U.N. that people are, are, are dying now because of climate change. no. <laughs> There's never been anybody that has died from climate change that I know of. They die from weather, but not from climate change. And she claimed that there are people that are that are having to move because of sea level rise. As far as I know, that's not true anywhere on Earth. Well, the no Obamas, to- yeah, the Obamas just bought a house right on the very coast. They yeah. say it's not going to exist. Yeah, I checked that out because I was curious uh, how high above sea level their house is, and it's about twelve feet. And uh, historically, there was one storm uh, in the last hundred years that hit that area where they bought their house that would have been enough to, to, to flood their house. So, you know, given that they're not going to live to be 110 years old, they're probably safe. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Right, so, so you so, mean to tell me if I buy carbon credits that I can't cancel out my airplane trip? Uh, yeah, that's yeah, gotta be one of the biggest, the biggest scams I've ever seen. <laughs> yeah, yeah it's, it's, a, it's a waste of time. I mean, it's, it's a waste of time and energy, but you really can't, you know, you wanted to talk about science 
Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah, get away from the, get get away from the religion and all of that. Yeah. I'm sorry, but you can't talk about global warming without bringing in religion, and because a lot of these people are driven by their religious beliefs. Right. You know that the climate system is fragile; that we're destroying it. Blah blah, blah blah blah. And that we only have ten years left. Still. Still. So, Doctor Spencer, would we be safe in wrapping this up to say that it is worthy of study? But it's probably not to the point that we need to absolutely do away with fossil fuels by 2030, that that might be a little extreme. Well, it, well, first of all, it would be impossible. It would be from an engineering and economic standpoint, it would be physically impossible to even get rid of 90 percent of fossil fuels by 2030. You know, the wind and solar are just they're 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 too expensive, too intermittent, too unreliable. Um and the public, you know, the, about our only modern solution for getting more energy that the public doesn't like is nuclear. You know, there's, they're still closing down nuclear power plants. Right. Uh, so we have no alternatives unless you want to go back to the Stone Age. And I think that's what some of these people actually want, is they want uh, some sort of system of society where there's uh, poor people and then there are the elites, that, and the elites get to use a little bit of a – of traditional energy and the poor people just have to get by and in the meantime half of humanity has died off uh, i think that's sort of what a lot of these people are, are trying to achieve but they most of them will not admit it yeah and, and conveniently they're going to end up being the rich people that still get yeah. to use it and, and dr spencer and you, you make a point to generate power even if you have battery cars or whatever you have to charge those you have to heat up something to generate power to make steam, whether it be nuclear, coal, natural gas. I mean, here in our home state of Alabama, now we'll dam a river up in a minute, and that's all good because it makes for some real fine fishing and skiing, but uh, you're only talking about 5% of the power we use in our state. So to generate power, you have to burn something. There's just no way around it. Yeah, well, it depends on the kind of, of power. Of course, electricity, you know, you can use electricity to make steam if you want. You know, I, my electric stove at home. <laughs> but I mean, to, to make the electricity or, uh, originally at the, with a generator, you've got you've to create steam to run through a turbine, right? Yeah, well, you know, but if you're using solar panels and windmills, then you don't have to do that to, to generate electricity. It just is. It's extremely inefficient. The energy density is, is very low of sunlight. I mean, I realize that the sunlight drives everything on the Earth. It just is the Earth is a really big place. You know, the Earth yes. is a big solar collector. And you can't compete with it with solar panels. Uh, the wind, yeah the, yeah, the wind can generate energy, but that's, you know, that's the very little energy there, too. Um, but so that's what I'm very, saying. To have constant power to do the oh, things yeah. we want to do, we, yeah. we've got to have either natural gas, coal, or or nuclear energy to to keep our lights on right oh yeah yeah right right yeah from a practical point of view you can't you can't you can't do it with with renewable energy yet i mean uh, we need some sort of new energy technology i really don't care where our our energy comes from but i do care that it's abundant that it's affordable uh that it's practical okay because that's the main reason i speak out on this uh, to the chagrin of, of my uh, my colleagues in, in 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 the science community, is that um, expensive energy is going to kill people. You know, we have our high standard of living now because of abundant affordable energy, uh, which is necessary for everything humans do. Everything we do requires energy. So, to the extent that you make energy much more expensive, you make life worse and worse for people. And for those that are already on the edge of poverty, it just pushes them farther into poverty. They can't afford health care, uh, and people die sooner. I mean, that's what we see around the world. There's a direct correlation between access to abundant, affordable, affordable energy and uh, how long people live. Dr. Spencer, thanks for being with us on Rick and Bubba University. Don't forget it. You can also get... Uh, the book that uh, Dr. Spencer has uh, touched on many of the things we touched on today, but even in more detail, it's called Climate Confusion. Uh, it is available at Amazon.com, BarnesandNoble.com, or wherever you get books. So, uh, Dr. Spencer, thank you uh, for being with us on Rick and Bubba University. You're welcome.